Well, if you were here last week, you'll know what this means. The burden remains. The question before us once again is what does true conversion look like? What does a real and lasting encounter with the living God do to a person? What essential elements, essential elements make up the experience of salvation? As your pastor, I want your assurance to be based on knowledge and truth, not on a whim or a feeling or the tradition of men. We must interpret our experience by the Word, not interpret the Word by our experience. And so God has given us, in many places in the Bible, real encounters with Him between real sinners and the real God. God has given us real examples of conversion for us to examine our own experience, for us to interpret, listen carefully, our experience by the Word, not the Word by our experience. When we interpret the Word by our experience, then we are putting ourselves above the Word. We're not, we're not submitting ourselves to it. We're actually elevating ourselves above it. One of these stories, one of these examples is before us this morning. It will guide us, it will teach us, and it will inform us of these essential elements of the salvation experience. I call it a tale of two thieves, and it's in Luke chapter 23. If you want to join me there in your Bibles, Luke 23. My prayer has been and continues to be this morning that everyone who hears this message would be saved and know it. Might happen today, it might not happen today. God's in control of the timing, but my prayer is that every single one of you would be saved from your sins and know it. Luke's gospel, if we just start with a big bird's eye view of this long gospel, it stresses the mercy and compassion of Jesus Christ, but especially to the least of these. One of Luke's themes is that Jesus is merciful to children and women and Gentiles and even a thief on a cross. Only Luke records the story of the repentant thief because his theme again is to emphasize that Jesus is boundless in his mercy. The run-up to our story this morning, it's one of rejection. It's one of harsh ridicule and mocking. The first hint of this rejection comes in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is there, you'll remember, and he is in dire straits. His three best friends are not even moved by his sweaty blood dripping from his pores. And then there's the betrayal with a kiss by Judas, and then the lead apostle Peter denies him not once, not twice, but three times. The number of perfection, it was a perfect denial. It was a complete denial, and that by the leader of the band. From there, the guards of the high priest blindfold him, mock him, and beat him, playing sport with him, saying, who hit you now, prophet? The Sanhedrin dragged him before the Roman governor, Pilate, with false charges of sedition, really, treason. They claimed that he was misleading the entire nation and forbidding people to pay taxes to Caesar. Both are outright lies. Pilate discovers that he's from Galilee and decides, oh, I can kick this can down the road. I can pass him off to Herod. That's Herod's jurisdiction, not mine. And Herod just happens to be in Jerusalem because it's the Passover. And so he shuffles Jesus off to Herod. Well, while that's going on, the soldier sees the moment to further abuse Jesus, mocking him with what Luke calls a gorgeous purple robe, crown of thorns, placed upon his head, slapping him in the face, spitting in his face, beating him with a long stick. And once they're done, he is shuffled back to Pilate. Herod had lots of questions. There were no answers. Pilate then summons the chief priests and the rulers because he's made a decision. The decision is this man is not worthy of death, 
for good measure, I'll beat him, punish him some more, and release him. The crowd screams, no, we want Barabbas. You see, there was an annual tradition at the Passover for Pilate to release, to pardon one criminal. And the crowd pretty much got to determine who this would be. And so they cry out for Barabbas, who was a notorious evildoer, a murderer, and an insurrectionist. Of course, this begs the question, what about this man? If you want Barabbas, this real thug, what about this man? And they say, away with him, away with him, crucify him. They can't even say the name Jesus. They accuse Pilate of being no friend of Caesar if he releases this man. So political Pilate caves to the pressure and orders his execution. It would be his final decision. And the rejection is now complete. You need to know that the cross itself was the ultimate in human rejection. It was designed for the greatest humiliation possible. Invented by the Persians, perfected by the Romans... The degraded, naked victim suffered for hours, even days. They finally succumbed to dehydration, exposure, and suffocation. There was zero dignity, zero pity, and pain of a 10 on a scale of 1 to 10. We'll pick it up here in Luke's Gospel, in chapter 23 and verse 32 for the first mention of these other individuals also enduring the brutality of the cross. Verse 32, two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying... And the verb tense here is he was saying it over and over and over. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, This is the king of the Jews. Led by the religious elite, the scholars, the Old Testament experts, their mocking rejection reaches all-time lows. Mocking him, he saved others. They couldn't deny it. They couldn't deny the miracles. He had saved others from blindness, from deafness, from muteness, from death itself, from demons, from illnesses, from paralysis, from fevers. He saved others. For sure he did. He can't save himself. It's just pure mockery. It's cruel. It's hateful. If we looked at Matthew and Mark's account of this, we find that these rulers, these Chief priests and these scribes, they actually used the Old Testament to ridicule God's Son on a cross. They used Scripture to mock His trust in God. Basic uh, summation of their message was simply this mockery. Hey, unfasten yourself from the tree, dust yourself off, and we will believe in you. That's all it will take. I mean, even the inanimate placard above his head is mocking him, designed for ridicule. Here hangs the king of the Jews. He is now an easy target, obviously. Everyone is piling on. It's as if the entire world has rejected him. So that even the criminal class follow the leaders. The lowest rung of society lash out, people being executed, mocking the innocent one. I mean, you know it's bad when someone on his way to the execution chamber is joining the chorus. I mean, you have officially reached rock bottom at this point. And it is here that we find the tale of two thieves 
I want to begin this morning where Luke begins in verse 39 with what unbelief looks like. In this tale of two thieves, first we will see what unbelief and lack of repentance looks like, what it sounds like. Verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Literally, it reads, one of the hanging evildoers blasphemes at him. It's very strong language. He's a hanging evildoer, not just a criminal, and he's blaspheming Jesus. Tale of two thieves, one of the two criminals. It's likely that these men were partners in crime. It's likely that they had committed the same evil. They had been tried together. They had been found guilty together. And now they are being executed together. Because of Matthew's account and Mark's account, it's often assumed that both of them, from the beginning, were hurling abuse at Jesus. That's often what we interpret when we see Matthew and Mark's account. However, given what the second thief says here, which we'll see in a moment, and given how strongly he says it, it would be the height of hypocrisy if he had been saying the exact same things as the first thief here. In fact, I think a better interpretation is this, that Matthew and Mark are using synecdoche. Synecdoche, that is a figure of speech where a part is made to represent the whole. And we do it all the time. Houston won by six runs. That's synecdoche. That's saying... A part represents the whole. When I say Houston won by six runs, you know I do not mean the entire city of Houston. You know that I mean the baseball team in Houston. A part represents the whole. I think that's what Matthew and Mark are doing when they say the criminals chimed in as well. They're saying one of them chimed in representing the criminal class. Representing this segment of society, he rails upon Christ. Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. This is sarcasm, not faith. This is mocking, not trusting. This would be like a cruel dad mocking his son who pretends to be Superman. He's mocking the supposed powers of Jesus. He's throwing it in his face. Demanding a salvation. Imagine what is happening here. Consider what is happening here. This man is hanging on a cross, and the cross itself has not broken his pride. He is still defiant. He is still arrogant. He is moments away from meeting his maker, and there is not the slightest glimmer of brokenness in him. This is what unbelief looks like. But just for the sake of discussion, let's give him the benefit of the doubt for a moment. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt that he has heard about Messiah. He's aware of a, of a man that would come and rescue Israel, that would have great powers. He's likely a Jewish person. Even if he's Gentile, he's in Israel. He's heard these stories. He's perhaps heard some testimony about Christ. Let's give him a glimmer of benefit of the doubt that there's some tiny little element of faith here being expressed when he says, save yourself and us. Even with the benefit of the doubt, look carefully. He only wants a physical salvation. He only wants an earthly rescue. He just wants down from the cross. He just wants out of his predicament. He just wants to get away from the justice that is due him for his crimes. He only cares about deliverance from man's wrath, not deliverance from God's wrath, even if we give him the benefit of the doubt. Like so many people with a profession of faith in Christ, without possession of Christ, this man is desperate to live, but he's unwilling to die to his pride. This is the person that wants what God can give you without giving God what he deserves. His heart is proud. His tone is obviously demanding. And he is angry 
not at, his, not at himself, not at his sin. He's angry at getting caught, right? He's angry at the punishment that he's receiving. This is unbelief in action. Harsh, demanding, proud, unbroken, earthly salvation, temporal rescue, no, no reference to God in this at all. At this point, it would be good to ask this question. Why is Jesus in the middle? All of the gospel writers make it a point to tell us this, that there were three of them and that he was smack in the middle of the three. I think there's a couple of ways we can answer this. From man's standpoint, and this is astounding, but from man's standpoint, you put the worst malefactor in the middle. The middle gets the most attention, right? The middle is front and center. And so in the eyes of the Romans, in the eyes of the Jews, whoever made that decision, he's the worst. Put him in the middle. But from God's viewpoint, I think something else might be going on here. Why is Jesus in the middle from God's viewpoint? Because he is going to divide humanity in half. Humanity is divided and represented here then by these two criminals, these two thieves. Like the prodigal son and the older brother, also in Luke, these two men represent the whole world. And this angry, belligerent thief represents one side of human depravity. Now, to be sure, we are all criminals against the government of God. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all evildoers in the eyes of God who deserve the wages of death, to be sure. But those in this first group, represented by this criminal in verse 39, they come to Jesus with a demanding attitude. They come to Jesus with, I deserve this kind of spirit. There's no humility, there's no brokenness, there's no desperation, that all I really deserve is death, and all I can really do is beg for mercy. This man represents people who want the good life now and heaven later without repentance. They want the good life now and heaven for eternity without repentance. And I ask you, do you see yourself in this thief, this criminal of verse 39? Do you see yourself in him? Do you dishonor Jesus with your words? Do you dishonor Jesus with your thoughts about him? Maybe you belittle those who love Jesus. Maybe you criticize them. Maybe you judge them. Maybe you are annoyed by people who love and trust Jesus. Are you this man in verse 39? Look at this. He is so close to Jesus, is he not? He is so close, and yet he is so far away. He went to the right person. Even on the surface, he has the right words. His motive is wrong. His heart is wrong. Close and yet so far away. As someone as well said, the same sun that hardens the clay melts the wax. As Paul said, the gospel is an aroma of life to life to some and death unto death for others. As Paul said, the gospel is foolishness to some and it is the very wisdom of God to others. Jesus divides humanity in two great categories, and these two criminals represent them to us. Well, how will Jesus respond to this criminal hanging beside him, hurling abuse at him? How will Jesus reply to him? How will he respond to him? Crickets. No response. Total silence. Because this is how Jesus always responds to the prayer of pride, the prayer of arrogance. He doesn't even place any merit on this man's words, this man's request, this man's question. He gives him nothing but silence. This is what unbelief looks like, and this is the response of God to unbelief. Now, having seen unbelief and rejection... Luke will now contrast that with the other thief, with the other criminal. Again, unique to the gospel of Luke because Luke is all about the compassion to the least of these. And in this contrast, 
Now we're going to see what true repentance looks like and what simple faith in Christ looks like. So here's the rest of the outline. Verses 40 and 41, true repentance. Verse 42, simple faith. Look at verse 40 then. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? Well, this is an unexpected twist. Didn't see this coming. This man comes to Jesus' defense. Jesus is silent. He speaks for him. He defends him. And what we have here in verse 40 are the first fruits of his repentance. He now fears God. We don't know at what point that happened. I mean, the mere fact that he's hanging on a cross as a condemned criminal tells us it hadn't been long. This man now fears God. His partner in crime does not fear God. Do you not even fear God? He says. This is baseline, is it not? You see, this unsaved criminal in verse 39 does not fear God, and this is what is always true of the unsaved. As Paul said in Romans 3, there is no fear of God before their eyes. This is what sets apart the saved from the unsaved at some level. The language here is really fascinating. In our modern <laughs> words, he's basically saying, dude, you are in it. He literally says, you are in it. It's happening to you right now. Are you stupid? Are you foolish? You're about to meet God. You're about to die. We're getting the same sentence. Look at verse 40. You are under the same sentence. You're in the same sentence of condemnation. And you're blaspheming this innocent man. What did he ever do to you? This is an incredible statement, verse 40. Look at what all is implied by what he has said here. This pictures for us repentance. It's happening before our eyes. Implied in his rebuking and implied in his statement to the partner in crime is this. There is a wrathful, holy God who should be feared. Number two, there is life after death. Number three, we will give account to this God. All of that is implied in verse 40. Verse 41. You know, just, he's just pointing the finger in verse 40, right? You're like, uh, hello, <laughs> you're on a cross too. Verse 41, and we, we indeed are suffering justly, righteously, <clears throat> for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Again, true repentance here in verses 40 and 41. He literally says, we are getting worthy of our deeds. Worthy. We are evildoers. We deserve this. Bro, this is right. <laughs> What is happening to us right now is right and righteous. What an incredible statement this is. We're sinners. We deserve death. Matthew Henry says, True penitents acknowledge the justice of God in punishment of their sins. You see, verses 40 and 41 show us true repentance. You know, many people admit to being a sinner without being saved. Happens all the time. It's most of the world. Admit to being a sinner without being saved. Well, how is that possible? Because you can admit to being a sinner without repenting. Saul did it all day long. Judas comes to mind. No, this is part of repentance, you see. Repentance involves sorrow over your sin. Repentance involves knowing you deserve death and punishment for your sins. Repentance involves then turning away from them because you renounce them and you hate them and you long to be free from them. This is a turning of the heart from that which you formerly loved to that which you now hate. 
all because you see yourself as condemned by a just God that to be sent to hell would be righteous, that I would deserve it, and yet this man has done nothing wrong. I repeat, true repentance says, I am worthy of death. And if you haven't got there, then there's something faulty in the repentance. I am worthy of death, but in the words of this criminal, not this man. I love the original language here. What he says is, he has done nothing out of place. Nothing amiss. Translated, he has done nothing wrong. It's real simple. It's real simple. I am guilty. He is innocent. <laughs> this is the beginning steps of Christianity. I'm a guilty sinner. Jesus is righteous. How did he know this about Jesus? How did he? That's a bold statement. That's a big statement. This man has done nothing wrong. How did he know? Two reasons. Number one, the Holy Spirit. Oh my goodness, just step back and marvel at the invisible work of the Holy Spirit in this passage. The Holy Spirit convicting this man of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit bringing the gift of faith and repentance. The Holy Spirit drawing him to Christ. Hardening one, softening the other. The same son does both. So the Holy Spirit is the safest and the most correct answer as to how this man knows this about Jesus. But I think there's a second reason. I think he has been privy to overwhelming evidence. Has he not? I mean, one look at Jesus and you know that this man has been through hell in the last 24 hours. He does not look like the other two. They have beat his face, plucked his beard, driven a crown of thorns into his head. He has been scourged nearly to death. He could not carry his own cross. The man is a bloody pulp. They're looking at him. They're right beside him. They got front row seats on the execution of Jesus. And they were able to hear him say, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They know this man has a relationship with God. They're saying, look, the overwhelming evidence is simply this. I can conclude if he is responding this way right now, this has to be the worst moment of his life, right? This has to be the absolute worst moment. If he is responding like this right now, then he's never responded in sin. <laughs> he's never lashed out. He's never become sinfully angry. This man has done nothing wrong. This man is innocent. He obviously is not like us. Verse 41 is his, woe is me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. We justly, we are receiving what we deserve, what we're worthy of. It is the biblical pattern, is it not? So let's recap. Re repenting involves fearing God fearing his wrath, and fearing his judgment. It involves admitting that you deserve punishment. And it involves confessing, I'm guilty, Jesus is righteous. He may be numbered with the transgressors. He may be identifying with transgressors. He may stand in the place of transgressors, but he is no transgressor. Be clear about that. And I love his fruit of repentance. Look at that back again in verse 40. You see, the fruit of repentance is you're not afraid to rebuke other people and call them to fear God and repent of their sins. Not afraid. He's bold. He's courageous. He's outspoken. He speaks the truth in love to his partner in crime. This is what repentance looks like. And now for faith, verse 42. For faith. And he was saying, again, imperfect tense, meaning over and over and over. He's saying it in desperation. He's saying it in gra with gravity, with urgency. He was saying, 
Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This is simple saving faith. There is a deep longing rising out of his heart here as he just says over and over with his what little strength he has while hanging on a cross, Jesus, remember me. Jesus, remember me. Jesus, remember me. Jesus. Joshua. Yeshua or Yeshua. It means Yahweh saves or Yahweh is salvation. He's calling him by the name Jesus here. This may be, I, I didn't look up all the references of Jesus in the New Testament because there's over 500 of them, but this may be the only time in the New Testament anyone directly addresses Jesus using his personal name. You can help me on that if you know of others. I do not. Most of the time they call him Lord. You know, when they're talking to Jesus, they call him Rabbi, they call him Lord, they call him Teacher, so forth. They use titles, but this man addresses him by his given name of Yahweh is salvation. And the prayer is so simple. The faith is so beautiful. He says, remember me. Keep me in mind. Don't forget me. <laughs> Think of me. It's actually an imperative. So it's in the form of a command, which doesn't tell us that he's being arrogant or demanding. It tells us that he's being urgent. It tells us that he's being desperate. It tells us that he understands the gravity of the moment. He's on his deathbed. Look at what is implied in these simple words of verse 42. Think with me. When he says, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Jesus is hanging on a cross. He's hanging on a cross. They're going to die shortly. Implied in this is you are about to die, but you will live again. And me too. This is not going to be the end. Implied in this is you are a king and you are going to come into your personal realm where you will rule and reign, right? <laughs> when you come into your kingdom, implied in all of this is this is his confession of Jesus as the Messiah. This is his version of Peter when he said, you are the son of the living God. You are the Messiah. Here's a beautiful sinner's prayer then. It's this simple. It's this short. Messiah Jesus, look on me with favor and forgive me and accept me. I want to be your subject. All of this is implied in verse 42 when he says, Jesus, remember me, forgive me, accept me when you come in to your rightful kingdom. This is so instructive. This is so revealing. It's so contrasting to this other criminal. He says, remember me, not prefer me. He says, remember me, not honor me. He says, remember me, not enrich me. It's very humble. There's no demanding spirit here whatsoever. It's pure desperation. It reminds you of another story in the Gospel of Luke where two men went up to a temple one a Pharisee and one a publican. And the Pharisee boasted in what he did for God. And the publican would not lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. These two men, again, representing all of humanity. You may be surprised to learn that this is not the first person to pray this way in the Bible. To pray, remember me. It's actually fairly common. It makes me wonder if the man was raised right. If he was brought up in synagogue and then took a very bad turn. Who else prayed like this? Samson prayed like this just before he died. Samson had been humbled of his pride. His eyes gouged out. He's standing there in the temple and he says to God, remember me. Hmm. Who else? Hannah Hannah prayed this prayer when she was begging God for a child there at the temple. Humble Hannah prayed like this, remember me. Nehemiah prayed it four times in the book that bears his name. This godly, humble, dependent man prayed to God that he would remember him. 
Job and Jeremiah, while suffering, prayed this. Go with me to Psalm 106. Not, a, not an example of a person, but an example of really the whole nation of Israel when they're in their right mind. Psalm 106 and verse 4. Remember me, O Lord, in your favor toward your people. Y'all with me? Everybody there? Psalm 106, verse 4. Remember me, O Yahweh, in your favor, in your grace toward your people. Visit me with your salvation, that I may see the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. Verse 6. We have sinned like our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have behaved wickedly. Perhaps our thief on the cross knew of Psalm 106. What we have then in his simple prayer of remember me when you come into your kingdom is simple saving faith in a merciful Messiah. Look carefully, there are no rash vows, there are no promises for great godliness, there's no resume of good works, there's no giving money to the poor, there's no baptism, there's no making amends, there's no providing restitution for whoever he had robbed or potentially killed. He does not have the time, nor does he have the ability to even go to the people that he hurt and said, I am sorry. He can do nothing. He can do nothing at all. And this is because he vividly reminds us that the only thing we contribute to our salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. All he can do is beg the king for mercy. He also illustrates a verse that we love. If this is not an illustration of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, I don't know what is. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. He is the poster child for Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. He is the poster child for salvation is by grace alone through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from all works. He represents then all dying and helpless sinners who are in no position to make demands, who are in no position to negotiate with God, who are in no position to bargain with the Almighty. God does not negotiate with terrorists. If you want His forgiveness, you get it on His terms and His terms alone. There is no bargaining with the Almighty. Your only play here is to beg for mercy from the coming king before it is too late. How are we saved? How do we experience salvation? It's simple. Repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ. This equals conversion. If you do not have both, you do not have conversion because they are two sides of the same coin. And where you have one, you will always have the other. Where you have true saving faith, you will have repentance from sin and vice versa. 40 and 41, his repentance. Verse 42, his saving faith. Now how will Jesus respond? Before we look at his response, I want you to consider what could have been his response. Crickets. Silence. Silence. Maybe a brief no. So he's made his request. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Are you serious? A sinner like you in my kingdom? You've got to be kidding. Have we met? Or how about this? Wow, you know, this kingdom you talk about, it's way, at this point, I'm on the cross. At this point, it's way out there. No, instead, none of those were the response. Instead, we get lavished 
grace that goes beyond what he asked, goes beyond what he wanted, goes beyond what he even could dream of. Look at verse 43. He just simply asked to be remembered in his kingdom in that future time. And Jesus says to him, truly, I say to you, to you and no one else, today you shall be with me in paradise. This is lavished grace. This is what happens in salvation. You ask for forgiveness and God gives you so much more. You don't even know what all you're getting when you get saved, do you? It's unbelievable. And here's a picture of it. He says, amen, or truly, or with certainty. I'm not talking to that other criminal anymore. I'm talking to you. This is one-on-one. -on -one. It shows us that salvation is always a one-on-one -on -one transaction between you and Jesus. No one in between. No one else is concerned at this point. Truly, I say to you, today, and this is in the emphatic position in the Greek sentence, Today, not tomorrow, not tonight, today. No purgatory. I mean, if anybody ever deserved purgatory. No penance, no purgatory, no sacraments required. Today. There is no soul sleep. There is no delay. He says, today we die, and today you and me together in paradise. This is unbelievable comfort. This is unbelievable sweetness and consolation and solace for this man's soul. He just asked to be remembered, and he gets so much more. He gets the best of all worlds. He gets the very best that Jesus could offer. I mean, to be with Jesus is great. To be in paradise is great. But the best possible combination is to be with Jesus in paradise, right? <laughs> That's what he tells him. There's nothing better than this. There's nothing greater. There's nothing sweeter. There's nothing more healing. Paradise is the word for a park or a garden, a place of beauty and delight. This is the word used in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the, New, of the Old Testament, for the Garden of Eden. Used here in the New Testament, it describes the third heaven, the heaven of heavens, where Paul was caught up. It describes God's holy presence to bless. It describes the greatest place man can ever imagine. It is a place of perfect love, perfect peace, perfect beauty, perfect joy, bliss, glory, wholeness, peace, everything. All in the constant, uninterrupted presence of our triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there to bless us. What a comfort this had to be. What a merciful Savior we serve. Jesus himself is dying. Jesus himself is about to be cut off. The Father is about to turn his face away. He's about to endure the hours of darkness. He's about to bear the wrath of God for the sins of his people. And he looks to this man in his need and he says, Truly I say to you, you will be with me today in paradise. What mercy is this? Believer, I want you to tuck this away for a rainy day. I want you to tuck this away. I want you to put this in your back pocket. I want you to remember this. If the Lord, perchance, would give you a deathbed, you will need this. As you're breathing your last, today you will be with me in paradise. If you're here today and you are lost you're not a believer in Christ. You don't have true repentance and simple faith in Him. You need to understand that you are one heartbeat from hell. One. Just as He was. Now, for Him, it was obvious. It was, it was apparent. But the reality is the same for anyone who is lost. One heartbeat from hell. But just like Him, you can narrowly escape by the skin of your teeth. <laughs> You can spend eternity in heaven. The contrast is incredible. I mean, one minute he's hanging on the cross, the next moment he's going to be walking with Jesus in paradise. And so can you. Why? Because Jesus always responds like this. He always responds to repentance and faith like this. He always receives those who come to him humbly, desperately, and in faith. This can be counted on. This can be banked on. This is who he is. You simply need to admit your wretchedness that deserves death and punishment and beg him for mercy and he will respond just like this. You too will be with him forever in paradise. You will not be left behind. 
Don't love your sin any longer. Turn from it. Renounce it. Rebuke yourself. Hate your sin. And turn away from it. And then don't trust your own goodness any longer. Trust Jesus Christ. He is innocent. He's never done anything wrong. Trust me, you have. <laughs> I have. Don't trust your own goodness. There's nothing there. You're standing on a cloud. You're, you're grasping the wind. There is no goodness in you that can commend you to a holy God. Simply admit and trust in the goodness of another. The bottom line here, I think why Luke puts it in the gospel is simply this. If Jesus received this man, he will receive you. Come in confidence to Christ. Come boldly to Christ. Come right now to Christ. That would be the message of this dying thief. He's not here to say, oh, you can wait. His case is an extraordinary case. His case is not here to say, oh, take your time. In fact, rather just the opposite. His case is here to say, do not delay. Do not delay. And if you do delay, if you wait and wait and wait and wait and put it off and put it off and put it off forever and ever and ever, then these words from Matthew Henry will surely haunt you for eternity. Matthew Henry said this, True repentance is never too late, but late repentance is seldom true. Let's pray. Father, what a gracious God you are. What a wonderful story this is. What a beautiful picture of your mercy through Jesus. Or somebody might be here that says, I'm a, I'm a pretty bad sinner. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've thought. You don't know what I've said. And I would just say, you think you're as bad as this man? Someone may say, well, I don't have enough time left in my life to make amends. He is here to show you that that's not part of salvation. Father, thank you for this great, great story. Thank you for the mercy that is ours in Jesus. Lord, for us who are believers here and have assurance of our salvation, because we've repented and because we've trusted Christ and no one else, I do pray that you would help us to tuck this away and that we would be able to pull it forth in that moment of need. For it has been appointed unto man to die once, and after this comes the judgment. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.